Okay, welcome everyone to the afternoon track for uh, Froscon. Um, in this room we have Polina Malaya from the Free Software Foundation Europe. She'll uh, tell us a bit about uh, uh, EU policies and uh, what they'll, uh, they have for influence on uh, open source projects. So, welcome. Thank you. So do you hear me? Yes, I hope I hope it works. Okay. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Paulina, as I've been already introduced, and um, I'm a human rights and intellectual property rights lawyer, a digital rights activist, and working for Free Software Foundation Europe as a policy analyst and a legal coordinator. And today I, I will give you a talk about EU policies and the most actually the most recent ones uh, that are important for free software and how FSFE is uh, active active in this topic. So um, there's been there have been several attempts to include free software on, into discussions on European level, and FSFE was following them through, from the start. But um, like through through the policy advocacy work, so that means publishing analysis, uh, meeting with the officials, um, campaigning for a change. Um, but uh, let's start from the beginning. Oh, not working. It doesn't work. Sorry. Um, and um, so throughout the years, um, uh, the free software in the EU in in the EU, in the EU uh, was mostly a part of internal IT. Uh, strategies policies which were just only for like IT departments within the institutions and not not much of a like a overall general policy uh, field and one of the examples are uh, European interoperability framework uh, which was officially um, I mean it was an official document uh, from the start at the beginning um, um, yes for public administrations to increase interoperability uh, within public administrations and uh, and also the other example is the open source strategy in European Commission and uh, this was mostly uh, as a response to the excessive vendor lock-in uh, within the EU institutions so that was that is still evident from uh, software purchase agreements in public procurement. So that means that EU institutions directly require um, acquiring particular vendors. For example, Microsoft is one of the most dominant vendors. And that also resulted in the uh, case um, in front of European Court of Justice, um, where Microsoft uh, was actually fi fined uh, for its anti-competitive behavior on the market of desktop operating system. And FSFE was involved as an intervener in this case uh, to represent the interest of free software developers. So we argued um, that there is an excessive vendor locking in the EU institutions. So despite all these efforts, um, by 2016, the vendor locking still stays steadily, and uh, this is according. This is some data according to some um, the most recent um, study on on the locking and ICT procurement. And um, so, according to that study, 52% of all respondents amongst public administrations have experienced vendor locking. And even though um, the um, awareness of that problem is high within the public administrations, they still feel almost powerless to question any alternative software. And um, so the most um, top occurring um, vendors uh, that institutions are, are buying are then Microsoft, Oracle, SAP, and Windows. So this is what they require to acquire. Um, so, but the meanwhile, the world outside of EU is changing and um, free software is everywhere and uh, it, it's basically you can't overlook it and because of nearly universal software development practices. So, EU has to somehow address that topic. And so, what is the key to success? EU questions. And uh, so, the reaction on the EU level has to has to follow, and the most one of the most like interesting documents uh, and the most recent ones is the digital single market strategy, uh, which was adopted uh, last year, and uh, it's an umbrella initiative with different legislative and political uh, reforms on the EU level, like how to how Europe can become an ICT 
a leader on a global level. And so, yeah, so EU tries to identify like these key areas. And from free software perspective, um, the most like important for, for, for free software are then the standardization policies. And EU identifies that the priority areas in standardization are then cloud, Internet of Things, big data, cybersecurity and 5G. So this is a priority for, for the EU until the end of 2019. And uh, how to implement the, those policies, um, you also identifies then um, a couple of um, instruments. Um, this is a joint initiative on European standardization, rolling plan for ICT standardization, annual union work program and European interoperability, and interoperability framework. So, um, and one of the most like, so one of the most interesting areas like yeah, documents within this is the uh, another communication, uh, which is from April this year, and it's actually made some 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 noise in the in the community a bit, and um, from civil society and uh, yeah, a, bit, a bit in the media because of its um, yeah contradictory nature, and um, so um, it actually includes some really positive aspects for, for, for free software. So here we have to like acknowledge that before EU was only focusing on free software as a part of internal strategy that was not supposed to go outside of, of the IT department. But now we're talking on some like a more general policy objective that might even somehow be reflected in the law. But yeah, who knows? Um, so um, yeah, so the standardization priorities says that proprietary solutions can hamper the potential of the digital single market and that we need common open standards and that we need to make more use of free software. And that is also for uh, Internet of Things. It's the same that we need an open platform approach and promote open standards and also in, in data the same. So that's, uh, that's all the good positive steps there. But it, of course, it's not always as good as it as it seems from from the beginning. So that's just a little, little yeah. So there is no cloud, but the commission says there is, and uh, there is one um, like um, yeah, fly in the ointment. Something that uh, that despite all this good stuff, commission says before, uh, it bases its standardization policy on front licensing, and. That is unacceptable for free software. So, why is Front bad for free software? So, um, Front are then so called fair, reasonable, and non discriminatory terms to license uh, standards that are essential, no, uh, patents, uh, to license patents that are essential for standard implementation. So, standard. Is, is, is a common norm agreed within the industry uh, and uh, it contains in specification which is protected by copyright but it can also include references to patented technology and in order for a project or implementer or, or company to implement that standard it needs to acquire the, the, pat the patent license and uh, this is how also um, industry has resorted to these practices, mostly in telecommunication industry, and saying that, okay, like you have you as a patent holder have that right to restrict your the standard implementation and you have to license it so so it's um, accessible for everyone on then on these fair, reasonable, non discriminatory terms. But the problem is that as licenses, these front licenses are negotiated in secret, it is very difficult to know what is fair amongst the industry and what is reasonable and what is non-discriminatory. And for that reason, um, front licensing practices where you were, are mostly and very often used as um, um, anti-competitive uh, tool to abuse the monopoly that patent hold, patent right holder have, and um, so that's why it's not favorable in general. But it's also especially not acceptable for free software because um, it goes against 
um, the licensing terms uh, or and how free software is distributed. So, th so uh, the problem is that it's um, mostly an exclusive license, which means that you only negotiate it once with particular implementer, but the other the other implementer who wants to implement the same technology has to go again to the same patent holder and negotiate it again, and it also includes usually um, a requirement to um, pay royalties, of course, per, yeah, per copy. And in free software, it's 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 difficult to calculate because there is because I mean, there's just the license is non-exclusive and the distribution is not limited. So in conclusion, this is why it's not suitable for free software. So what can be solution? Um, a commission and also because the industry doesn't know what is front and or I mean, it depends on the on, on, on the negotiations. Um, there is a possibility to define front on EU level. So it's acceptable for free software and that just re, re, like removes all these restrictions. And um, but the problem is that it's not front anymore. It's a restriction free licensing, which is already in use for software, web and internet standards. And the reason why internet is basically functioning. Um, so yes, so that's uh, that's about front. And as we already like briefly said that the European interoperability framework um, is um, is one of the, those instruments to implement the standardization policies, then it's also, yeah, so let's take a look look into that. Um, so it was uh, first um, adopted as an official guideline uh, for public administrations like within the EU. And it was a really um, interesting document because despite of its unofficial status, uh, it actually set an example for numerous national policies and um, and included a very nice progressive approach at that time for open standards. It was actually requiring that in, in order to ensure interoperability, uh, the open standards are need to be promoted, and uh, also the licensing policies were, were were quite were quite good in this in the sense for for open standards and um, um, yeah free software, and um, so. In 2010, uh, EU European Commission thought that you know it's a it's a nice document that could be from also be sort of like lifted upon from being unofficial to a more official status, and uh, that included a massive lobbying, and so the the document was completely changed, and the open standards were in the end not called open standards and they were called open specifications, which is misleading term because. I mean, it only reflects the specification part, which we already touched upon before, um, and it doesn't address other issues. And it's also like it's it's just watering down the existing existing common uh, common known term. And it also introduced first uh, the front that we just yeah um, touched upon. And um, so FSFE identified identified that evident uh, copy based. Uh, in the uh, leaked drafts from European Commission and the lobbying group's positions that were handed in. So that's just like a, a screenshot from that. Like the, you could see that the, um, yeah, the, the pink parts were just the exact copy paste from the business source aligned comments that were submitted. And then the, the draft, so they just like, our commission just took one side instead of uh, being impartial. Um, yes. So in 2016, European interoperability framework is again on agenda. So it ha actually is going again through a third revision. And um, the problematic parts are still there. So they're still taking basically the same approach as in the previous version that um, there is no reference to open standards. And um, also from the wording, it seems that they um, that the document is being even more lifted to like a, even more stronger language is used that because they're already talking about how member states should implement that, which is a bit like too strong language for for such document. And uh, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, just ask quickly. Okay, yeah, it's good. I would, would like to have them in the in the end, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you said 
this uh, approach was more unofficial, and then we have the second uh, 2010 mm -hmm. uh, the, with more official character. What does it mean in legal? And what is this yes. uh, now in, in uh, how, how legal? And okay, yes. Yes, I understand the question. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, f yes. So in 2010, it be it became from like more more internal document. It became it became an actual initiative, which means that okay. So this is an official document from from the EU, and even though it doesn't have any legal because it's not law, so so these old policies that are basically like they used to shape the existing laws in in the member states but it's so basically like if if member state would not implement it nothing will happen because if 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 yeah if law is not implemented european commission can sue state before european court of justice but in this case yeah, nothing will happen they can just issue some recommendation being like yes please because you know um, there is a supremacy of of these policies but in the end uh, in the end Member states are free to do whatever they want. So, the, but the problem is that, like, it, you could see that it gradually becomes more and more binding, and that's why, like, that's why we should care about it because we don't want this to end up in the law if it go if it goes wrong, because the, then that's basically the question. So the problem with the what happening now is we only I've only seen one draft version. And it's just a speculation so far. Like that's why we need to act like when it's still in a draft, rather than deal with the consequences later. So, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. So um, f so it to yeah 2010 it became an official document. Before it was unofficial. It was just an internal. And then it was an official document, which is already an initiative. And they also issue like studies and 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 see how member states. I mean, they score them according to okay, how much of that you implemented in your state. Like, yes, they 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 can't legally do anything, but I mean, it depends. It, I mean, depends on the member state. Like, how if 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 EU come or if some study shows that they are lagging behind, I guess member states will see okay, we're lagging behind. Maybe we should do something. So it kind of like depends, but yeah, but it's still like from from 2016 perspective, it's still better to to shape it. Because shape it in the right way. Because even if it actually becomes a law, then yeah, it will be difficult to do something when it's already adopted as a as a directive, for example, or something like that. Then it has to be implemented. Yeah. So I don't know. If I hope I answered your question. Okay. Yes. So on that note, <laughs> um, uh, yes. So th that's the language is stronger and. Um, one good thing about the draft right now is that royalty-free licensing is a preferred notion, which is a good thing because royal, I mean, at least it eliminates from front the royalty criteria, but it doesn't uh, address other restrictions that such licensing terms can pose on um, yeah, free like free software distribution. And um, yes, so that's on the. Uh, so that's an interoperability framework. So digital single market, um, this umbrella initiative that the European interoperability framework is a part of, um, I think it's easier to understand why it affects software uh, because it deals with such questions as ICT standardization of technologies. Uh, but there we, come, there we will come to an actual uh, law that is already adopted, enacted, and... and um, can have um, a, new, a more impact on free software than the previous instruments we were talking about because there are just been policies. But now we're talking about the radio equipment directive. And um, yeah, so how we get to know about that was actually a little like a little accident uh, because uh, we were following the discussions in the in the US, uh, which um, were talking about introducing some um, yeah dangerous software compliance regime, and uh, we we thought that okay we're going to look into our own laws, and apparently it turned out that because we didn't follow those policies and like non-binding documents, we actually missed. Uh, that part when, yeah, when when something dangerous was introduced into into the law, and um, and that is then a radio equipment directive, which we call radio lockdown directive, 
And um, so a bit of background about that. Um, so uh, it's a directive, which means that it's a law and um, member states have to implement that. So if that's not in the in the nation, national law, uh, a commission can can sue a state. Yes, um, and um, so it's uh, it was adopted in May two thousand fourteen, and it affects um, all devices that can send and receive radio signals, so through Wi-Fi, mobile network, GPS, and. Its main purpose was to harmonize the existing rules. So there was already existing uh, another directive before that, um, but it it wasn't harmon like it was it wasn't implemented um, in the member states. And member states were, yeah, were just creating like their own rules. And so for that for the harmonization purposes, now uh, this new directive was introduced. And um, so. Nash, Nash, yeah, member states had two years to implement it and uh, so yeah so it was actually this year not too far far time ago and um, but the problem is that it actually introduced a uh, dangerous requirement to for to ensure for safety and security reasons um, and it's basically like put an obligation on on device manufacturers to say that uh, to ensure that the, the combination of hardware and software, um, like you know, yeah, so yeah, so I mean, how should yeah, um, so the so uh, basically saying that okay, for security reasons, you can only put this. But you have to show that that software that can be put on that hardware uh, is safe, and that means that it just puts a very disproportionate obligation on device manufacturers to test every possible hardware soldier combination and yeah say that okay this is secure and this is safe and that basically creates a very dangerous situation where in fear of being liable for 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 some i don't know safety critical um bug or something then they would just make sure that no like not no no alternative software can be um, put on the on particular hardware. Um, so that in the end means that you can't use alternative software on mobile on such devices as routers, Wi-Fi cards, and basically all Internet of Things devices. And uh, that was then all justified for the security reasons. And but it turns out that. Um, installing alternative software actually helps increasing the device's security and it also puts a very a strict obligation that is unnecessary for such products as a router or a laptop which has a limited radio output power so it's yeah it's a very vague obligation and yeah i mean it's also again as law has been very general but it it's basically still creates that uh, that backdoor in the in the law and but there is uh, something that we can still do despite it being already an official law that has to be implemented and um, so the problem with this uh, obligation is that it is a new one and it hasn't been introduced uh, yes yeah, so it hasn't been introduced before uh, according to the previous um, directive and so how to implement that particular obligation in the member state is for first member states uh, to decide because it's a directive, but also um, the European Commission has has to come up with with like an additional delegated act to say, okay, these these devices you should you should check for that compliance, others not, and uh, so and these acts has have not been adopted, and um, so. If if these acts could be somehow be influenced, then then there is a reason to abstain from this dangerous um, impact. And um, and so what we are arguing for is that in the member state, on the member state level, uh, yeah, and first that the delegated act should be done right, and that on member state level, um, there should be an exception for free software. That say that it's okay to put free software or 
or for a widespread and critical consumer devices, saying that, okay, these particular not critical infrastructure devices should not be impacted with this because it severely hampers consumers' choice and competition on the EU level. And uh, so uh, what FSFE has done is that we published, we were one of the first to um, draw attention to that and we published the joint statement no, before we just published an information page and many um, companies and organi other organizations came to us saying that, okay, I mean, it's something that we should also look into and can we somehow support it? And then we came up with the joint statement. So it's still open to signatories. And if you feel like this is something you, that should be, uh, should have an impact on, should, yeah, should change on EU level and you want to have like more voice into it, put more vo voice into it, then you can still sign it. And these are just one of the few um, companies and organizations who decided to, um, yeah, to, to support us there. So, uh, and yeah, so and many other, you can, you can, yeah, you can check the first link and see any, all the other organizations. And so, yeah. I'm pretty quick today. <laughs> and uh, so if you want to support us in these areas and topics and on our goals and to make sure that we don't miss anything important for free software on the EU level, then uh, you should subscribe to, first maybe subscribe to our newsletter because then you'll be updated on what's going on. And we also have always an action action item there so the neighbor can act upon or yeah, write to their member of European Parliament or something like that. And, or you can also order a promotional material and spread the word about us. And if you just don't have time for that, then you could always just support us with money and donate. Yes. So. Uh, you can always drop me an email if there's something, some topic uh, you you would like to draw my our attention, and or just be always in support of like we're always in need of like technical expertise or anything like that. And thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I open the floor for the questions and questions and answers. Thank you. I have one myself anyway. Okay. Um, you, uh, regarding the, the regulations uh, you were stating about uh, wireless devices, for example, um, you said that you're pursuing uh, local uh, governments to put in that exception mm -hmm. for open source devices. Um, but given that the Americans have a somewhat similar legislation similar, yeah. uh, and device manufacturers mostly work on a global basis, I think, do you think that they'll still make exceptions in at the device level to uh, to uh, yeah run open hardware uh, open firmware on there because if they have to limit it for the US and not for three countries in the EU or mm -hmm. all but three countries in the EU would they make a separate version for that do you think well there's yes there's also actually there's been um, a case already in US I think it's yeah in the beginning of August about that uh, it was yeah so it's about like uh, TP link and there was exactly for the same requirement of software yeah so software and hardware compliance and uh, so the so the court was saying that the alternative software should not be hampered by that but they still uh, find TP-Link to be liable, which is a little bit like, okay. Mm. So, yeah, it's actually, it's, it's a good question, but um, I mean, the, the problem is that laws are different everywhere, and even despite, it, yeah, the manufacturers acting globally, they're still acting in every different country according to the country laws. So, okay, it might not be that in US, but it might that, it, it still might be that in Europe. So, laws are not universal. So, I mean, and manufacturers have to abide by the national laws. So, I would say that there is, I mean, at least at at at, at some point, there 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 is a hope. To make it better, <laughs> hope so too. <laughs> you should care about that, yes. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Oh, thanks. Um, it's very concerning a little bit the uh, what's happening there on EU, EU level. Um, what I'm a little bit concerned about, like stuff like routers or something like that, are basically complete um, 
computers and machines. Yes. So they are basically the same as a desktop computer or a server. And we have also radio interfaces in a laptop, notebook, whatever. So could those radio regulations also Im have an impact if all cases fail on laptops, for example? Uh, yes. Free software on, on laptops also. So we're not just talking about network equipment here. Yeah. Uh, this, yes, exactly. So this is also what our concerns because of it, because of the wording of uh, of the directive is so vague that all the cases can fall in, in, under that. And this is what make it, makes it so co co concerning because be before that we didn't have that requirement, and now suddenly we have that, and that's why it's really and so it's really difficult. It's like it's to say whether it was that because you was unaware of what of what this can yeah can can bring, or it was something yeah that some 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 lobbying went too far at some point. Yes, so laptops, yes, Mo smartphones, yes, fall under that. It's crazy, I crazy. Thank you. I'm not sure how much this really affects smartphones because uh, the, the parts uh, uh, really interacting with the uh, radio stuff uh, mm -hmm. at the moment they aren't free when you are using Android or some, uh, something similar you have binary blobs for uh, for the Wi-Fi interface and other radio interfaces and you have a separate processor doing the um, cell phone uh, stuff so I don't think it affects smartphones so much it's it's already bad so I, I don't think it will get uh, worse because of this regulation and then notebooks at least there are wi-fi chipsets which are hard have hard max so the wi-fi stuff is done in hardware more or less so mm -hmm. there's some kind of interface which is well defined and i, I think laptops uh, are more or less concerned by that but routers are really a and the Internet of Things are uh, really a tough uh, thing. Uh, um, and uh, about the regulation, uh, at the moment, I, I think smartphones are usually registered in, in Great Britain, where, so they acknowledge uh, the organization like F FCC, like in Britain, mm -hmm. they register and say it's okay according to the regulation. Okay. So, I don't know how uh, Brexit will change that probably. So uh, perhaps there will be some under, other country where most of the equipment will be uh, controlled and checked whether it is uh, fulfills the regulation. So it might be useful to find out which country that is and put effort to uh, influence the regulations there. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. That's a really good point. I agree. Um, I'm interested in uh, the case um, of overseeing the, uh, the development of uh, the, the law. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, the Free Software Foundation the only organization that have uh, could yeah, prevent it? Uh, uh, when when not oversee it, or are um, other um, uh, non-governmental um, organizations around that uh, also overslept it? Yes, actually, with uh, RD, uh, we were the first ones to publish anything on that. So, and as much as I talk to other civil societies, they're all like, "Yeah, we missed it." So it's it's really it's it's really because of its uh, highly technical nature and the fact that it's it's not a trendy topic of privacy and mass surveillance or something like that, which is usually most of the digital rights organizations are focused on, and yeah, and also like other free software organizations or open source free software organizations, um, they're also like overlooked it, and that's the really unfortunate unfortunate it's it's really it's it's like it's like no one could ev even like see that before before a more yeah like because in us I mean, there was more media attention to that and everything like this and in our case yeah in europe it was just passed like that so yeah we were the first ones 
Then when and it's already quite late. An eye on. Mm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That's the lesson. That's the lesson we learned from this. Yes. And trying to save it last minute somehow. Yeah. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you again. Thanks. Um, next talk uh, will be at 4.30. Uh, not in this room, because next talk here is cancelled. Uh, we skip a slot. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Thanks. And just one one last uh, remark before before I go. Uh, my colleague Max Mill will give a talk about RID and compulsory routers campaign in Germany. And if you're interested in more details about that, then yes, uh, go and see him at 16:30 in the first room. Yes. Thanks.